And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast live from Los Angeles, California, where my guest and I just left uh, what was... I don't even know what the right word was. An unforgettable memorial service slash celebration of Kobe Bryant, Gianna Bryant, and seven others who died in the helicopter crash in Calabasas. And uh, my guest is current Los Angeles Laker, Jared Dudley. How are you? I mean, I'm good. Just came from truly inspiring memorial for Kobe. I mean, probably, I said on Twitter, probably the greatest thing I've ever witnessed to be a part of that, man. It was just definitely breathtaking. Did you know, what did you guys know? Because for us, it was like, it was a mystery who was speaking almost right up until it happened. Did you know Jordan was going to speak? I did not. We didn't know anything, to be honest with you. And it's not even something we asked about, asked for. Um, they just gave us, you know, our plus one. This is the time. Be here this time to be seated. And it was more like, you know, I mean, obviously you, you work for the media, but for player-wise, it was just more we were so concentrated on the game yesterday. And then today was basically about him. And so they just say, like, just get here by this time. And I didn't think it was going to be like this. I knew it was going to be, you know, a wild moment. But this was, I mean bigger than anything I could ever even imagine. I guess I had to say, I just didn't internalize what it was going to be. Right. I thought it'll be a nice event and we'll, cause the, you know, I, I just, I didn't think Beyonce was going to perform. And, right. Um, Alicia Keys. Alicia Keys. <laughs> and, and I don't know what you thought, but I think that Jordan speech will go down as just an all time NBA moment. One hundred percent agreed. It was light hearted but yet deep when it came to his relationship. I mean, we don't hear Jordan talk that often. I mean, obviously I know he's an owner. Um, you know, his Hall of Fame speech. Um and it's so funny, even now, you know, he 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 remembers the memes of the crying thing, his little punchline he had about the crying memes. I meme. couldn't believe you brought up crying it, Jordan. Because it, 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 I don't think he likes that. I think no. he like seriously actually doesn't like that. Yeah, I don't think so either, you know. I definitely yeah, because everyone uses it in a negative way, yeah, for sure. But I just think that it didn't stop his emotions. He was crying from the beginning. You could tell they had a deep relationship, and it's eating at him. And it's something that you know that when someone leaves this earth a little bit too early, man, it's, it's kind of hard to you know to put in place. You mentioned his Hall of Fame speech, and one of the reasons why that's one of the things that will stick with me. Some people liked Michael's Hall of Fame speech because mm-hmm. it's like that's Michael. He's yes. competitive. He he's been he 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 remembers every slight. Yep. That's what fuels him. And but even those people, I don't th- even the people who liked it, I didn't particularly like. It, I didn't hate it, but even the people who liked the speech, I don't think it left like a great taste in their mouths. It's mm-hmm. like this was a moment, like you said, for a guy who rarely talks. Yep, the greatest basketball player ever, one of two, yep. probably the greatest ever, an absolute icon. This was his moment on the stage, and that's how he chose to use it. This was a completely different Michael Jordan, and I'm not going to say it like makes up for that because I don't think he had to make up for that, but. It was just, it was just so interesting to see that side of him, vulnerable, funny, just, and, and totally up to Michael Jordan speaking about Kobe Bryant that was essentially a funeral. I mean, like, that is a moment where it, that's just, that's so much NBA history. I mean, he's humanized in the sense that, like, he has emotion. Um, this is, this is bigger than Michael. This was obviously about his relationship with Kobe. This was about Michael. Letting us in, letting us in about him, about the stories of the 2 a.m. text messages, about how close he is with his daughter, how Michael now has twin daughters, has a daughter who's 30, who can, through his hatred, uh, not even hatred, through his rival and his pestiness and annoyingness of what Kobe was to him early on, became his love for him, his joy for him, and it really inspired him, and really, I believe, will inspire Michael through the rest of his days of living with how he how he treats his kids and how he and how cool he makes it. I got two daughters, and so how, I mean, I knew Kobe was a coach, but to this extent, and to how he locked in, just as he was as a player, calling uh, G- Gino, calling Jordan about tips. I mean, it, it's phenomenal to see how Kobe. Kobe was behind the scenes as a man, as a father. Um, who'd you sit with? Who, who would... I was next to Markeith Morris, our new acquisition for the Lakers. I was next to uh, uh, Swaggy P, Quinn Cook. I didn't see Swaggy P was Swaggy there. P, yeah, he was there. I mean, a lot of stars. Was Bron there? I didn't see Bron. Nobody saw Bron. I, I didn't see him, but I saw uh, Tarasi make a comment about Bron's fadeaway and kind of looked down. Now, that yeah. joke... That took some guts. Yeah, she looked somewhere like he yes, might have been there, yeah. but I, I don't know if he asked, "Don't show me up there." But yeah. I didn't. I didn't see him on the job. I mean, I'm sitting up in the 200, so I wasn't right. in position to see I him mean, there. I mean, Tarasi's the one person that can get away with it because, for one, she's the goat, 
when it comes to the woman's side. She has a, a good personal relationship with LeBron, with the USA and being how it is. And you, you try to make, a, 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 you know, sometimes when it comes to such a serious grieving matter, you have to have a couple jokes to make it lighthearted, to ease the moment. And, and that was early on. So I, I'm glad she could have some fun with it. And uh Well, she said something that will stick with me forever because I told you on the way over here, one of the things that I really loved most about it was – about the memorial at the celebration itself today was in that 20 minute montage to open the ceremony. Yep. There was so much footage of Gigi playing mm-hmm. because I, I had felt like since the accident, I had seen the five same clips of Gigi over and over again. And here, there she was practicing a lefty floater yep. on the, on the baseline. There she was playing defense, getting a deflection. She ran a pick and roll and passed off to the roll man who scored. Yep. And, and it was so cool to see just the more complete picture of her as a basketball player and Diana said something in her in her speech that just it kind of just hit me right in the gut where and it, you could tell it hit her too where she said you know Gigi was having the best possible time you can have as a basketball player because she's at the age where all you care about is playing with your friends and getting better there's yep. no bigger there's no who's the alpha dog on the team and this isn't what Diana said I don't know what what example she gave to counter so there, there's no you know money involved there's no trades there's no rumors it's just you and your friends playing and you trying to work at the craft of it and that just like she's right and that really hit me even when, when you know they had the little uh with Kobe's little skit they had up top where it's basically like the cartoon and how the love of a joy of, of a boy and he's, you know, eight seconds left shooting the fade away. And I mean, we all were like that. I mean, every NBA player, my son's like that now, you, you know, three, two, one, elbow fade away. It's always the fade away. It was, it, it was, jo- it was Jordan growing up for us. Now it's Kobe and how it is, you know, for some kids growing up now it's LeBron. Um, it's the joy. It's why you, it's, it's why you make the NBA. It's the love of the game. You didn't, no one, no one even knew how much NBA players made when you're seven, eight years old. All you wanted to do was make the shot in front of 20,000 people and put your arms up and celebrate with your with your teammates. Um, this may be a, a very dumb question, but <clears throat> I'm curious to know, you know, ever since this happened, there has been this idea that now the, the Lakers are playing for something. Is You were already obviously playing for something. You're competitive people. You're playing to win. But there's a larger purpose behind your season now. Is that something you talk about as players or is that just a media thing that we made up or does it just sort of exist and unacknowledged? Like we all know it. We don't have to sit here and talk about it. I mean, we're as an organization, a team, we talk about everything. Communication is crucial for us of how we want to do. It. And so it's not like, oh, let's win this for Kobe. Yeah. I mean, obviously you'd want to win for Kobe. You want to win for Laker Nation. We want to win for us. Like we came, you don't come to the Lakers with LeBron, Anthony Davis not to win. No, we, we've talked about, um, obviously Frank Fogel, phenomenal coach, man. And, and uh, you never know what to expect when you first come. And obviously him coming from Indiana and, and Orlando. I mean, his communication skills is the best right there in par with Doc Rivers when it comes to just his, his speeches, his talking and, and, and kind of relaying it. And so yeah, every, everything that's elephant in the room has been talked about, talked about Kobe and, and, and what our mission is and, and how. And so the goal is still the same. Yes. Is it added pressure? Yeah. You could say that. I was going to say, does it make yeah. it harder? I, don't, I wouldn't say it makes it harder. No. I think winning a championship is hard enough. Right. I mean, Braun always talks about the process and how it's going to be hard, the hardest 16 games you'll ever have to play to win. And so no, but I mean, if anything, it, it's just more inspiration for you, more stuff you have to go to it. And so you hear the Kobe chants, we're on the road. I mean, for us now, every time we go on the road, you have to, we're going to see all these video troopers as we should. We're trying to uh, mourn him. We're trying to go. And so it, it's probably more different now for these teams that we're playing against because now they're doing dealing I, for, for the first time. <clears throat> to us, it's normal. I said this the, a, a month ago in this same chair. This is a before and after moment in sports history. Like it's just, it's never going away. It's going to be a story that hovers over the NBA for the entire foreseeable future, let alone just this season. It, we're going to feel it all the time. Um, and it's funny you say that just the, what you said about the hardest 16 games. Yeah, as a player, you know that I, I, can, I just know from people telling me. The playoffs is a completely different animal, right? Totally different. So here's a story that that brought up. I can't say who the player was, but let's just say in the last two years, sometime in the last two seasons, okay. uh, a, a young player making his first playoff appearance, his team wins game one of a playoff series in the first round. Yeah, Good game. Good win. You know, you're up 1-0. Everyone's happy. He goes to one of the coaches and says, I can't believe we have to do that three more times. Like, I'm so drained 
from the men- the physicality, the the crowd, and having to focus. Like I I like I feel like we should have just won the championship based on just winning one game. Right. We have to win three more just to get out of the first round. I thought that this young player verbalizing that I thought was very funny. Man, the intensity of a mental and physical edge on every possession, the crowd being into it. The adjustments of a 6-0 run feels like a 10-12 to run compared to a regular season. Wow. Us winning one game one versus Philadelphia. And the adjustments you have to make, the harder a team will play. Um, I, I mean, something like you never can imagine. I remember going to the Western Conference Finals to sweep the Spurs. I think the second round we did when I was there with Steve Nash. I mean... Steve Kerr, I mean, not Steve Kerr, Steve Nash broke down crying in the locker room for one, getting over the hump, but two, just like, to wanting to beat a team so bad. He cried after the Spurs series. Spurs series, Because I I remember, ironically, in the very next round of the conference finals, you lose to the Lakers and Kobe in game six. I remember Steve weeping after that game because I I think he could sense this was our last best chance. chance. Yeah, I agree. And And he voiced that. He voiced that like, like, you get all the way here and this is your opportunity. An air ball, Ron Artest gets it. You can see it probably, right? You, you can, can close your it. eyes and see that First, play. You could I easily, like, no one's thinking he's going to air ball. Let's be honest. Like, Kobe, just by the way, right. people can remember. Yes. Kobe, 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 Kobe made, made it. Double him off the, yeah. off the, uh, you know, the sideline out of bounds. Ron Artest heads up, smart play, goes, catches it, puts it in. Jay Richards hit a bank three to, I think, either tie the game or up by one. And it was his box out. And it's, yeah, it was his box out. And, and, and so it, it's unfortunate because we know that, like, you win that game, you go back home for game six, which we, First two games, I mean, game three and game four, beat them pretty easily. Yeah, you're up three two, up and, three two, and to go now home. you're fighting for your life. You've just you've taken a gut punch, and you're thinking in the future, Boston makes it. As a matter of fact, if, you, if people go back and look at the score, we were two and over as Boston regular season minded, and beat them by like double figures both times. So you we're you could see what what can happen, but that's why Kobe Bryant's one of the greatest of all time. So let's dive even more into that. Um, yeah. A lot has been written about your flight home from Philadelphia when yep. the accident happens. And more than that, I think you guys took a day and then you came back and had a team meeting where I think LeBron started, let's talk about Kobe. Let's just let t- tell stories, right? It, it might have been two days. It might have been two. I don't remember yeah, exactly. Honestly, the last month just feels right. like I'm living in some no, sort sure. of bizarro no. movie. Um, what do you remember of that? Well, well, first of all, what story did you tell, if any? And what do you, what, what 50 years from now, what are you going to remember from that team meeting? Um, I didn't tell a story. It, it was opened up for anyone who wanted to tell something, and it was something that I think the organization wanted to do because, I mean, we've never been in this spot before. Uh, there's never been an all-time great that's probably passed away this young. I don't think we've ever ever, ha- ever experienced that. And so, for one, now you're dealing with with Kobe, with the Laker biggest brand, during a season where we're literally arguably one of the best teams going for a championship. And so, to hit that really dead middle, it, it, it just never happened. So, I think what they wanted to do was just try to bring everyone together and start the process of the morning, coming together, picking it up. And I just, for me, to what I remember most of it is just seeing all the commercials that Kobe's ever had. And so, you know, when when someone talked and told the story, then before the next person, it was three or four commercials. And it was just seemed like, man, like his transformation of, as a young man. But you guys would watch, were watching them? them? Yeah, they had, they had them on, they had them on, uh, on TVs around. Oh. It was basically, you know, it was a Kobe day, you know, and people, you know, and, and what he meant to them and uh, Dwight Howard and LeBron and different guys and uh, Rob Palinka. And it was, it, yeah, it was sad. It was definitely sad. I mean, like, let's be honest, tears were shed, guys coming together. But I'll tell you one thing, it helped us out a lot. And, and it helped us build them, not move on, but to, to just get everything out. Sometimes when you when you talk and you, and you talk and you sell and you talk about different things, it just gets it all on the line. But some, it's not even only the players. It's, it's the fact that it's his security guard, it's trainers that have had him for 20 plus years, even longer than we've even known him, that uh, uh, how he inspired and how he wanted to be better. And when it made these guys get their own personal business and, and work on their craft. And that's what Kobe Bryant really, to me, is, is inspirational. I didn't know you guys watched the commercials. Yeah. Any, any others, but from, from all of those stories, any, any that you'll remember, anyone that, you know, you, you mentioned sort of the supporting cast that doesn't get the public glamour, any stories about him? That, that you heard for the first time, they were like, oh. That's a good question, man. It, it, it's always a sense of subject because some of these people's stories might not want to have been out there, but I just think his head trainer, uh, Robert Lara, was someone who's been 
big for me in my career when I've had him with, even with the Clippers and stuff working for him. And he basically just was telling different players of what Kobe told, told him about, you know, if it was Anthony Davis and how, how he was a bad boy or, or me, how I used to foul him a lot in Phoenix and how, you know, it, it was like it was pretty, <laughs> stuff that I didn't even know and how he was and about, you know, you know, about a parade, us, uh, us, you know, us getting a parade and, and what it, what it means and how Kobe's been in him and for and someone's like that where, you know, no one knows who that guy is behind the scenes and how he was with Kobe night and day, his China trips, Germany, everywhere he went. And for him, the stories that he told Kobe about every individual player on the team and him express that to us, it's kind of we had a, a little bit more of a piece of Kobe in us after that after that speech than I ever had before. When did you what did you guys know about what LeBron was going to say to the crowd in the first home game after it happened when he, he he has his speech prepared and then he says you know what you you all deserve better than this crap and he puts the speech away and speaks from the heart and it was a moment that I think similar to Michael's speech today I think a lot of fans looked at LeBron a little bit differently after that speech than they did before or saw a side of it. what what so what did you guys know was going to happen the only thing I knew that I knew Usher was going to uh, sing the national anthem um, I knew that it was going to be very emotional um about boys to men singing, we knew that that we didn't. I, I, I knew LeBron was going to do a speech. I didn't know um, exactly what he was going to say. I don't think none of us did. There's one thing about LeBron, man. Um, he speaks from the heart. He's a leader. He's a, a natural born leader where he knows too much is given, much is, I mean, yeah, too much is given. Much, I mean, what's that, what's that, what, that Bible verse? Too much is expected, too much is given. There is something, something like yeah, that. So, so, something, something like that, that. Where, I mean, when I say that is he, he knows a lot of the pressures on him in a sense of carrying the face of the league. Obviously, his, his rival with Kobe, a businessman, a father, uh, a, a husband, and what he does. And, and he's a true, I mean, the biggest role model you could have in professional sports. And so you, everyone's listening to every word he says, and they're going to break it down, critique. And the best thing he could do was speak from the heart. And so when he did that, uh, I looked at him, and you're just hearing the words. And it's something that he feels pressure on him to have to fulfill, not just fulfill Kobe, Kobe what he wanted, but fulfill, hey, passing on the torch helping the, the, the youth living on to his legacy and so yeah I, I didn't know exactly what he was going to say I, I knew that they had about a, a five minute video they're going to do for Kobe it was going to be emotional if you saw guys crying and, and that's what that night was for it, it's for to get it all out on the game and not to move on but a to start the process it feels it, it sounds so stupid it feels good to have some of those moments where you just have a little bit of a belly laugh or a holy shit kind of moment and when LeBron threw the speech away yeah I was sitting at my house because I had just gone home the day before and just started laughing I said all right let's go this is gonna be and like when Diana Taurasi made the joke about LeBron's fade away yeah. today it just it feels extra good to just sort of and like and when Michael said now that there's gonna be a new crying Jordan me and my yeah. wife I everyone are I mean that's just like it just it's it just felt extra good, man. To have that spirit going through your body for just a second, it felt extra good. For sure. Anytime you can during a sad time have some sort of laughter in someone's in someone's especially when you're trying to celebrate someone's life and I mean as, as sad as we are, man, like Kobe put a lot of smiles on people's face forever. I mean, like, this is a global issue. This wasn't just the Lakers, NBA. This was global where you're seeing soccer players, all the people from Africa, all different continents, um, trying to do this. And, and yeah, it feels good. It felt good laughing at that. It felt with Shaq about how he's going to take it for, for his kids to help teach him post moves, but not his free throw. Um, to Tarasi cracking jokes, even, even Gino, a head coach from UConn about how, you know, this is bigger than just basketball. This is him as a father and how the, the, the text message he's getting from Kobe and, and we were laughing because, man, Kobe was crazy in a good way, crazy of perfection and wanting to do, to, and wanting to give everything he had and leave nothing in the tank. And he did that. What I have no words for is, you know, we're like, we're sitting there, all of us walking in like idiots saying, who do you think is going to speak, speak and who's this and that? I have no words for what Vanessa Bryant did today. It's phenomenal. I, I just, I, we, none of us, it was all, we all like, oh, there, there's no way she's going to get up and speak. Just no way, you know, whatever she wants to do. To, to get up there and take the stage for that long and talk about those two people in the detail and the depth that you did. I just sat there slack jawed in my seat. Like, I just don't even believe 
I just now on some level she chooses to do it, yeah. so she must want to do it, and it must feel good for her. <laughs> but when she got up there and she had to collect herself right at the beginning, Man. I thought, I wonder if she's now that she's taken the stage and realizes what this is yep. that she's going to say, you know what, I, I I can't do it, and no one would obviously blame her, but like sure to not. get up and do that, which I, I you got, apparently didn't know she was speaking, right? I didn't like know she's I, speaking. it's unbelievable to me. I know she picked this date for two twenty four. Um, I knew that. I, I didn't know who all was going to speak, and when she went up there, and you hear obviously the crowd, the cheers going for her. I mean, imagine that, man. Your your husband, your daughter. I mean, I I, I had tears, and so I can only imagine the grief that she's feeling. And for her, I mean, it tells you how how much how much courage that woman has. You can see why Kobe married her. You can see why how much how she talked about the love of her daughter and the love of her husband, and to be able to make it through. Yeah, tears came out, but. She wanted to lay it all out there and, and basically talk to them. She was talking to us, but it really was talking to them how much she missed them and loved them, what they mean, meant to her, meant to her. And I, I've never met her. You could just tell she's a phenomenal woman. She'll be in my prayers and for her and her family and, and, and she's family. Like I, I, could, I couldn't believe she got up and I still kind of can't believe it. Me either. Anyone who travels frequently knows how tiring it can be. Whether you're on business or on vacation, a five-hour energy shot can help you stay alert and energized wherever you may be headed. Five-hour energy helps you get through your crazy, on-the-go life. Zero sugar, four calories, and a convenient portable size. Five-hour energy is the perfect pick-me-up for busy, hardworking people. And now it comes in two great extra-strength tropical tastes, strawberry banana and tropical burst. Ooh. They are delicious and can take you to a tropical on-the-go experience. Try them both and then go online to shop the number 5hourenergy.com and use the code LOW, L-O-W-E, my last name, the name of this podcast, to receive a one-time offer of 10% off your order. That's not nothing. Go to shop5, the number, shop5hourenergy.com, use the code LOW, receive a one-time offer of 10% off. 5-Hour Energy, energy on the go. Let's do a little around the league stuff. Sticking with LA, there's this looming potential <clears throat> for Clippers Lakers in the playoffs. The league needs that. Which, if it happened in the conference finals, would just be like an all time, like if like a, a conference finals where you don't have to travel at all, mm. and it's these two big city teams. Um, you guys have played three times? Twice. Twice. We didn't play because the one after COVID. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was going to be the third one. That's yep. right. So, and, and they've won, uh, both games. Both of them. Key players have missed each game. Um, and it, it feels like, and, and personnel has changed. Trades yeah, have happened. The Morris, sure. brought, both more I are now involved. <laughs> yes. Um, feels like you guys are sort of cautiously circling each other like boxers in the first couple rounds of a fight. Um, do you guys inside your team, Talk about the LA LA thing. Like, is it something you want? Is it something? You, or do you have half an eye on? Oh, they're they're playing here tomorrow. Have you like? Have you watched their games? I won't say that we look at them more so than other teams. I think there's six or seven teams that really have a chance to, of winning it throughout the NBA. You always get sometimes it's a little bit more. You know, sometimes it's less in most NBA seasons. That's why this one's so intriguing. And so, for one. Yes, teams like the Clippers are going to have your eye. I mean, yeah, any time any team has Kawhi Leonard and Paul George and the, and the talent they have, especially them beating us twice. But it's not like um, you know, every time the Clippers are playing, we're everyone's watching that game. But no, we we definitely have an eye on them. You got to have an eye on Milwaukee, the way they've been playing. Yeah, but they're all the way out True. there. They're all yeah, the way in you, the other but, conference. But, but, as, but as players, you, you I mean, listen, you don't think that our players are watching Giannis play and watching Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid and, and or if you want to say this, the Nuggets. But yes, I mean. The league's ratings are down. You hear about that, and and to get these ratings back up, it's it's competition, it's rivals, and what right now besides the Boston as, you, as we just played yesterday, that was that game, probably the most intense game I've seen for us play this year was against the Celtics, is the Clippers, and so yeah, I think they're number two right now in the West. So yeah, I mean, do we talk about it? No, we don't talk about it. But we we just talk about our goals and what we want to do. But yeah, best believe we have an eye on the Clippers. Well, because the team's battled in free agency, obviously, too, and it's, it's yeah. been ongoing. But so the Celtics game yesterday, which I was watching on the flight out here and then finished up at my hotel, was is connected to the Clippers thing in this sense. 
some of these big wings are coming in here and handing it to you guys a little bit. And it was Tatum yesterday with 41 points. Yeah. And Kawhi is, is, you know, Kawhi gives everybody issues. And, and so at, the question on everyone's mind is, okay, so you've tried K- KCP doesn't seem to be big enough. Kuzma gets a shot here or there. You know, AD ends up being your best option on those guys down the stretch of some games. Uh, everyone's sort of waiting, like, does LeBron have another gear in reserve for a playoff series to take that assignment? Internally, what's the view of that issue? Is it an issue? Or are we making a mountain out of a molehill? What's the answer going to be? I mean, I mean, I, I would say, I'm not going to say it's an issue. I'm saying someone of Tatum statue. Tatum just gave it to Kawhi. Dude, yes. Tatum, Tatum uh, is. Let's be honest. Tatum's on, on another level. Dame gave us 50. <laughs> I mean, so these, the way you play defense in the NBA, stars are going to go off. And so for us, is, as you saw, I, I mean, Kawhi's kept, no one's really talking about it. You saw LeBron guard Tatum in that fourth quarter towards the yep, end. Yep, they put he him on did. at the end. That's he right. He did. So you don't think on crunch time in the playoffs when we need to get stops in that fourth quarter, it, it would be it would be foolish of us to put LeBron on the best offensive player every single time. No, you can't. When people, he played, people who are asking, come that, on, are, it's it's ridiculous. That's for one. So no, it's not. It's, I, but that's why I'm saying I yeah. wonder. Does he have? I don't wonder. You you don't wonder. I don't wonder. Does I mean, he does he have a fourth quarter of it? LeBron, does he have a whole twelve minute fourth quarter for sure? Okay. LeBron is the most well conditioned athlete in the NBA. I've seen him and the way he takes care of his body. And when when everything needs to be done, needs to be done. Well, I'm not worried about him. For us, we need to get better as a team, working on our defensive issues or certain stuff or how we want to be. And good thing we have 25 games because we're, we're number one in the West, but we still got a ways to go to be able to improve the way we, we want to be going into the playoffs. And so for us, yeah, I, I would say sometimes the point guards ha- ha- have had quick point guards and, and threes that have, they have. But at the same time, you got to worry about us too. And, th- and that's how I look at it. What have you learned? Everyone talks about LeBron and what they learned finally playing with LeBron up mm-hmm. close and all that. I'm curious, what have you learned about Anthony Davis watching him up close every day that you didn't know? His desire to win. And the reason why I say that I've been in this league, I see a lot of these players here get 20 and 10, 25 and 13. And when they're losing, they're making all-stars, they're okay. When uh, when AD has, I remember it was a, one of the games, I think he had like 13 and 13, and we won, and he was happy. And I've been on many times with all-star players that aren't happy if they don't get their numbers and win. And if they get their numbers and they lose, yeah, they're mad, but not really. And so for him, his desire to win, to if it's in the weight room getting up early in the morning, which I think LeBron's had a huge influence on that, if it's getting his shots and doing everything he can, challenging players, myself, Avery Bradley, defensively, LeBron at times, offensively, wanting to do whatever he can. If it's taking a backseat to LeBron at certain times, if it's getting to the free throw line when it's needed to dominate the game, his desire to win, I didn't know he had to this extent. And I think a lot of people, I think he answered that question when he wanted to get out of New Orleans because he wanted to win. It's funny that I just wrote a big profile on Bam Adebayo. Yeah. Um, and he has that thing you're talking about. Yep. Look, every player likes their numbers, right? right. Every player wants to, you, if, if you, your choice is to score 20 and win or zero and win, you want 20. Like that, sure. everyone's wired that way. <clears throat> but one of his high school t- coaches told me, I may be conflating two games. I don't have my notes in front of me. The happiest he ever saw Bam was in a game. They were playing Jason Tatum's team. So maybe an AAU. I can't remember exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the other team just took Bam out of the game. Bam had seven points. It, it, but down the stretch, the coach asked him, I need you to guard Tatum for the rest of the game. And he shut Tatum down. Hmm. Seven points, some paltry number of rebounds, and they win. And the coach is like, Bam was the happiest guy in the whole locker room. And I knew after that game, like, this kid this kid gets it. Because he didn't care that he scored seven points. He didn't care that other people were outshining him. He was, like, super excited to guard Jason Tatum and win. I don't know, Bam. But by the way he plays the game, you could tell that. He makes the right play every time. He doesn't force it. Defensively, he wants to guard. Uh, yes, you credit a little bit of the Miami culture because that's what you, you've seen what they've done, but you could just tell the way he carries himself as a young individual. He, he, he plays every possession like it's his last. He plays hard every time. And, and you see his assist numbers are up. So someone, when your assist numbers are up, like Jokic, that means you care about your teammates, LeBron James. These guys that have high assist numbers, and sometimes it's the hockey assist. It's, you know, he gets them off a pick and roll. He swings it to the corner. The corner swings to the wing. He hits the three. hit hands up. He's ready. Next possession, locking up. And so when you tell me that story, it's easy for a player like that. I can see.
Sometimes for inspiration, you just have to look up. For more than 60 years, the Goodyear blimp has fueled greatness on the gridiron by providing aerial coverage of some of the most legendary moments in college football history. When the Goodyear blimp rises above a stadium, it inspires players to reach higher and rise to the challenge of the game's biggest moments. Now it's your turn to go further with Goodyear. Discover tires made to rise above the rest. Learn more at Goodyear.com. Goodyear, more driven. So let's bounce around the league with Jared Dudley because yep. one of the things that people like about you is that you're willing to actually say what you think. For sure. Um, the hockey assist brings to mind a, a weirdly, a weirdly like hot button topic in the NBA this year has been how good is Trey Young really? Mm-hmm. And, and some of the criticisms of him spoke, it's, it, it's criticism. Like I think he's on the verge of being like wildly underrated as a passer. I think he's a great passer. Me too. But some of the criticisms you hear is, he only passes when he knows he's going to get an assist. The hockey assist thing is not in his game. And I think part of that reason he gets that is that's like a byproduct of the Steph Curry comparison because Steph was so selfless and smart about, I'm going to use my shooting to get other people open and I'm going to give up the ball and go set screens and all my teammates are going to pop. And like Trey hasn't really done that, but like not a lot of people have ever done that, like what Steph does. So I don't know if it's fair to look at Steph and say, well, why doesn't Trey play that way? I, it's not fair because I'm gonna say for one, it's his second year. Okay, so let's let's, let's get that on perspective. His his assist numbers, I mean, obviously are great, but his turnovers is one of the worst in the league. Yeah, too high. And the reason why is because every time we go into game against Atlanta, we want to take him away. Anyone set for him? Let's double on pick and rolls, high hands, get deflections. He's undersized. And at that time when we were playing him, there's no John Collins, so they had no four when you throw it to be able to make plays. So a lot of times he's throwing to the four, then coming back on it. So I would say half his his turnovers are for fatigue. Another half is we're basically saying anyone except for you because we don't believe that the other the other your supporting cast. Go can ahead, Cam. Go ahead, Cam Reddish. For sure. Go ahead, Cam Reddish. And so, and, and not even just Cam. You have the, the Hunter kid who's, who's young. They now added Deadman. It was Alex Lynn. It's, it's the players that you need to be able to beat us on a consistent basis. Only way you could do that is if Trey Young is having 35 plus, hitting seven, eight threes and doing that, which he's capable of. I think that Atlanta's going to get better. The reason why they're worse this year is they got a little bit more talented, but they lost the veterans. They said, hey, we're going to go with, you know, we, we got these three first round draft picks. We're going to make our trades. And because of that, you're better in the long term, but you're worse in the short term. Once they put the right personnel, a la Draymond Green, give him a Draymond Green on that team, on those pick and rolls, Draymond would make guys like Cam Reddish and Hunter better because now he's a decision maker when they trap him. So uh, I think it's a little unfair. I'm, I'm a big Trey Young fan. I do see Steph Curry in him, but they're going to have to start putting, which they will, in the next couple of years, the right pieces uh, around him. Um, what do you think of Houston going all in on we're not playing any big men? I think it's big for the NBA, for the big man, to beat them, to keep the big man alive. Interesting. And the reason why, if they're successful in what they do, it's a copycat league and there'll be more teams doing that. I think they're the one rare team that can because they have two of the top ten guards in the league that are some of the best one-on-one players. And they have my guy over there, P.J. Tucker, who might be the best defensive player that we don't talk about. I put him on second. It's ridiculous. I put him second team. I think he might have been how, first how team. How has he not made an all-NBA team? He, look, I put him on all defense last year, first or second team, I can't remember. Because, look, even if you think at his his that PJ Tucker's A plus defense yes. is not as good as Draymond's A plus defense or Gobert's A plus okay. defense. Fine. But that dude is playing PJ Tucker A defense for as many minutes as the Rockets need at every single position. I think now he's even more valuable than ever. He literally should get a raise of how much what he's doing. He's now the center. He guarded A D when we have to play. So before he has to guard Braun, they switch all ball screen. He's guarding Gobert. I've had to guard Gobert when we've gotten small ball. Gobert usually kills Undersized five because he gets the rebounds, the seal position. He lets Mitchell uh, drive in because he gets the duck in. They have no problem with Utah when they play. It's because of PJ yeah, Tucker. They, they, I they, know they, they don't. He don't. I know it's. I know it's obviously Russ playing a high level. So, um, so it, it's important for us and other teams to have to be able to for the big man to stay alive and and to be prominent because they're already they've already devaluing the big man that it is is having to beat Houston. It's interesting because they haven't been hurt by post players. They beat you guys. Yeah. 
Um, and and Boston had small guys on AD mostly yesterday. Yep. And and AD AD's best offense in that game was missing an offensive rebounding his own shot. Like the first post up shot, the jump hooks, the floaters just weren't going in. And Boston teams are going to live with that. Like he's either going to have to make a lot of those, yep. or you guys are going to have to find other ways, like offensive rebounding. And, 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 you know what? And that's good that we're, we're going through it now because there's many different ways. Because a lot of those teams, they switch ball screens. So maybe it's AD at the elbow. Maybe it's him set, setting screens and ceiling. And he's going to have to work on his variety of ways of how to score against these small ball. And, and a lot of it is when he's going to be at the five. And so, uh, listen, that's a good problem for us to be able to deal with because at the end of the day, AD is elite scoring on the block, elbow, and at the three point, uh, three point shots. He's hit two big threes versus Boston, which I thought was one of the, one of the big reasons why we won. Cause once he hit those two threes, they left LeBron one on one with Jalen Brown. He had some big buckets in that fourth quarter. We all had our fair share of sad breakfasts. Beige, plastic wrap, brick-shaped protein bars, day-old break room donuts, disgusting, frozen breakfast trays, no way. Not our finest moments. But now that McChicken breakfast sandwiches are on the McDonald's breakfast menu, we should never go back to those old, sad breakfasts. The McDonald's McChicken is a breakfast worth getting up for. It's time to change your life for breakfast. Buttery, crispy McChicken biscuits and savory sweet chicken McGriddles, freshly prepared and now available nationwide, everywhere at McDonald's. That's how you wake up breakfast at Participate in McDonald's for a limited time. Bouncing around the league with Jared Dudley. Who's a player that you've never played with that you would want, that you would dream of playing with? Like one guy that's like, man, I can't believe I've never played with him. I got to play with him. It's not, I, I can't believe, but if you look at the league right now, I would love to play with Luka Doncic. Okay. Luka is going to get star players to play with him. He has the LeBron quality where being one of the most unselfish superstar players, because I would say now Luka's in that superstar category. I think he's earned it this year. I know people say we need three, four years. He's phenomenal. Do I think he flops a little bit too much? Yeah, but hey, you know what? It's smart. A lot, of, a lot of people flop. Yeah, you have to. You really have to. Now, and I'm telling you, I love the refs. I talk to the refs every pregame. It's rewarded. And I know they say it's not. And I see it. I see it with LeBron, him driving, and, and he doesn't flop. I know he, I know when I, when I played against him, you think he does flop. I mean, he might, you know, you know, when he gets hit, he might do a little too much when he's on the, when he's falling on the ground. That happens. But when he goes to the basket every day, and when you give your little head snap back and feel like you've been shot, it gets the call, man. But Luka Doncic for me is that John Wall back, the guys that help you get paid, the LeBrons, John Wall types, it's Luka Doncic right now. It's funny you say that he's going to get superstars to go there because completely unrelated, three separate dinners I've had with front office people around the league in the last six weeks, three different people have said a version of, you know, all this talk about what's Giannis going to do and this and that. You know what our nightmare scenario is? And I said, what? No, but not everyone is using the word nightmare, but like doomsday, whatever. Yeah. And I said, what? It's like, if he ever went to Dallas. No, no, and no state no, tax. And those two guys <laughs> paired up together, it would be a wrap. And I thought to myself, it's funny, before people started saying to me, and it, to, to be 100% clear, no one has said this is happening or right. going to happen. This is just people spitballing about sure. random stuff. But this is what okay? we do. But I hadn't thought about it because when you think about where guys are going to go, Dallas has just not ever gotten the big free agents. Uh, and when they got one, the Clippers kidnapped them and make sure they didn't get him. Right. Um, so people think LA, like Miami gets in the mix. There's been the, like Toronto rumblings for whatever reason. And it's just, I just never, ever thought of it. But I'll tell you this. I don't know how you feel. I kind of think it would be good for the league if he stayed in Milwaukee. And and by the way, there is no sign that the Milwaukee train is slowing down right now. Milwaukee train is not slowing down. It's not. Giannis is on, a, is on a tear. I played there one year, had a great experience with Giannis. Felt, you, you saw felt it coming, help him. I but, saw, you hey, but you didn't see this coming, I don't no, think. No, I did not see this coming. I saw all-star. I saw the work ethic like no one else. In the more hey, his brothers now, who I play one of his, I play with one of his brothers. They were there morning time, night time. They lived in that gym, not just basketball. I thought I'm throwing football around. Those guys just loved just to hang out at a young age. Um, what I loved about him was he's like a sponge. He would ask questions. And I remember the year I left and I went to uh, the Wizards and we played against him. He told me like, "Oh, I miss having you on the bench to come back during timeouts." What I saw out there, out there on the floor because I'd always tell him and I do that now with Kuzma or AD, and it's something that when a player 
who wants to be so great, and even now he is great now, who's still a sponge, who still wants to learn, that's what makes greatness. And, and you saw that with the Kobe speeches, how him calling, you know, Michael and what he sees and, and that. I mean, don't, that, that's, that's what really greatness is, man. I like that Michael Jordan, you know that you're really, really, really famous when it's like, oh God, Kobe's texting me again. Like this guy's kind of, <laughs> this guy's kind of, like this Kobe Bryant is like kind of annoying me with all this text messages where it's like anyone else gets a text from Kobe. It's like, oh, this is exciting. I'm talking to Kobe Bryant. There's only one, there's only one black cat. Good Jordan, man. Name yeah. him or don't name him, whatever you want. Okay. Along the same lines, is there a coach you absolutely would not play for? Uh, I mean, would not play. I mean, the only coach I didn't really get along with was Doc Rivers. I mean, but he's a phenomenal coach. I mean, Doc Rivers best had the best pregame speeches I've had. I mean, he make you want to run through them all. And mine was more just not even on the floors. It's more business of bas- business basketball. And I've talked about that. Yeah, that, that you've on. talked yeah, about that a lot. Sure, but no, but no, I mean, no, there's no, there's no coaches I wouldn't. I think that y- y- when you think of the top coaches in the league, you, you think of, you know, you obviously pop, you think of, um, uh, Spo. Brad Stevens is in that mix. You think of, um, but when you, but I'm just saying, like, when you hear stories about, like, so be the beeline era in Cleveland is over. Yeah. When you hear story, and there are other coaches you hear stories about, like, the practices are long, the shoot arounds are long, everything, like, the that. And Gunnies was like that. That you wouldn't turn you that. off. Like, that turn you off. I think the, I think the one now is, I mean, it was before was, uh, Miami was the military, how it is. And so, you know, they had Wade and Braun that went through that era and, and now they're back because they've drafted phenomenal, but it's, they run it like a military and they run it their way. It's been successful, but that it, through chatter around the NBA, it turns off a lot of players. Um, well, it's not Miami knows that they're not for everybody for and sure. They're, and they're fine with that. Exactly. Hey, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. They've been successful. Pat Riley's one of the best to ever do it. I'm just saying around with the league, what players talk about. Have you reconciled, <laughs> reconciled is strong. What is your, what is the current state of your relationship with Ben Simmons? To refresh people's memory, I think you said so, you said something that Ben Simmons didn't like about well, we don't you don't have to guard him so much in the half court. I was saying that he was average in half court, yeah. where, where he was elite in transition, which is still. I mean, I'm not gonna say it's still true. I mean, obviously Ben Simmons has picked it up; he's gotten better. He, I think that if ever a time where him and Joel Embiid are not teammates and they put the right pieces around him, I mean, we played him without Joel Embiid and he looked. Superstar esque. I mean, how his team, his thing. No one clogging the paint. Him having that. But no, our relationship was never bad. Um, at summertime when Jordan, I mean, when uh, LeBron was having a Space Jam filming at six a.m., we had workouts. Ben Ben Samus uh, came up to me and dapped me up and said, "Man, what's good? How you been? Everything's Wait, good." Wait, are you in Space Jam? I am not in Space Jam, okay. but I was there at six a.m. Working out what, because LeBron's because schedule had, was had schedule and he had a lot, the pickup games were phenomenal and we, I played against Ben with guarding him in there and then even when I checked into the game at Philly I mean hey, I mean for they one, booed you they booed me I love so I got love some good fans I love when like like <laughs> like um like they booed uh, Santa Cleveland fans are gonna boo Kelly Olynyk forever because of the Kevin Love shoulder separation from like five playoffs ago Wizards fans boo Kelly Olynyk because remember him and Ubre went yep, at it were yep. you on that team I was no, not that, no, that's I was after. Not that time. I remember seeing that though I remember seeing that I love when these little rivalries that only the diehards <laughs> yes. really remember like sure. really take hold like cause you faced Ben in the playoffs yes. last year and it was a thing then too huge thing huge thing and uh, and that's why I tell you the intensity is different people are gonna act different are gonna play different especially when you're the underdog like we had, we had no real chance versus Philly, we won game one. That, their, their, their team was better, had more talented, more stars, but you have to play with a certain chip. And so I'm trying to help these young guys, Jared Allen, D'Angelo Ross, cares the intensity of a play. This is not regular season. How it has to be to be able to be a team, especially a team that is way, the odds of them winning are, are, are greatly exceed yours. So no, I love the Ben Simmons. He's playing phenomenal this year and stuff that he, he knows he has to improve certain things. I'll tell you what. I'm crossing my fingers that this back injury is not serious, that he's had for the sure. MRI for it. I because agree. Even in that game against Milwaukee the other night, and I love the Philly-Milwaukee matchups. I just love watching I, I, I want to see that playoffs. He he had two takes to the rim in that game, where if the first two or three months of the season, and this had happened earlier in his career too, he'd get ahead of steam in transition. And if he saw somebody getting in his way that might foul him, you could see sometimes he would slow up and sort of veer away from the yep. rim. In that Milwaukee game, and really over the last month, but crescendoing in that game, he was like, foul me or not, I am going. going to the bucket. And to me, for all the focus on his jump shot, that's the first most important step he's got to take is to just be willing to get fouled and make free throws. 1,000%. His, his, in transition, 
he's one or two best players in Trail You can't Houston. do anything with it except foul him. And, and not even that, his passing to three-point shooters. He leads the NBA in most three-pointers. And it's, it's not close. It's not even close, and he has that. And he's all, man, he's already an all-star. We're nitpicking. Let's be honest with you. I, well, I'm nitpicking when I was talking last year about him being the half-court. I mean, yes, because you know why? We see that potential in him. We see that he could be a top-five player, that he can have that same jump Giannis has. But I think the biggest thing that he doesn't get credit for, which he is phenomenal at, is defensively. He's... I, he, he could be a first team all defensive guy this year. I think, you know what? I think he's going to be. I haven't sat down and but done he, the list. He don't, yet. he don't get the praise and the talk like that. If anything, it's just, it's just starting. Like, it, it, to me, it was last year how he was doing it. He's phenomenal defensively. And so for him to be that top five, he has to take the shooting, get into the free throw, as you say, and say, Hey, I don't like Giannis. Giannis airball threes. Who cares? Giannis will throw in the occasional airball free throw just to like mix it up. For some that, hey, but his confidence, I don't care. I'm going to shoot it. And that's where the level he has to get to. But and hopefully one day he does. Um, do you ever talk about politics in the locker room and without naming names unless you want to name them? Are there any known Republicans on the Los Angeles Lakers roster? Uh, n- none that I know of. Yeah, for sure. If, some, if, Trump, if Trump says something crazy, we, we might, th- we, you know, we might talk about. It, but now you, you get so used to it now, right? Um, but no, not really, not really politics like that. But more social issues of what's going on, and sometimes that is politics. So it depends. Like Cap, Kaepernick, and what's going on with him. Sometimes you might talk about that. But it wasn't like we watched the debate last night. Came in there and said, "Hey, did you see Warren's Warren's debate issue?" Now we, we, we don't go that that extreme. I just, do we have a, like a, a known, um, like, like really public Republican among NBA players right now? Like Spencer Hawes was, was the last What's one. What's the one from the, uh, the Wizards who used to play for the, uh, the Lakers? Wagner? Mo Wagner? Mo Wagner? Is it Mo Wagner? Was it him? Am I, am I, am I getting my people confused? I don't know. I don't know. I cannot speak to Mo Wagner's yeah, political I, I think, leanings. I think he was. I think he was a Trump guy. I think it was. All right. I'll have to look that yeah, up. Yeah, look that up. If not, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be – what I'm saying is there's got to be for sure. some closet Republicans in the NBA landscape. Easily. You saw, by the way, the, if the only voting for, If only because of money. The voting, for sure. For sure. I've, I've heard that comment. It's my name the players. Hey, I'm voting for Trump just to keep my money. We've heard it. I mean, we say it jokingly, but at the end of the day, is listen, when you're in that booth voting, you know, only you know. What would you think of the All-Star game uh, ending? Phenomenal. Target score? Phenomenal. I think th- th- That's why the NBA is the best. Even though football is God, I understand that. We will change a rule during the season. Remember the jumping on the back and the free throw lines. I mean, we'll we'll change how the you know if it comes to draft the the the, the balls, uh, uh, who gets how many this time because you of uh, tanking the target score. I mean, it was phenomenal. You see LeBron trying to pull up Owens from half court to try to end it over Giannis, like stuff like that. Like you get that. Like, is he really going to game him? Like, oh, okay. Uh, no, I loved it. I loved it. I, I love what they're doing. I thought the dunk contest is back. Even after Zach Levine, I thought Aaron Gordon was phenomenal. Even though he got robbed, I, I just think the the league is doing a great job and I, I think we're going to continue next year be on the lookout that mid-season tournament is going down I'm just happy that Taco Fall didn't get injured I was really worried that he was going to like Why? suffer a neck injury because nah. you, you can't jump over Taco Fall you know when you bring him out there yeah. Aaron Gordon is going to push off his shoulders probably hit him in the head or something like I was worried Taco Fall was going to get hurt nah nah you, you, uh, it, it's phenomenal how how athletic these athletes are and how, how agile they are, man. We're, we've been doing this since we were little kids of having dunk contests, but I, I feel you. But it just, man, just, just that was a great All Star weekend. I know you got a lot of people who love you in Brooklyn. Yes, who you're still talking to in Brooklyn. For sure, you talked up Brooklyn's chances as a free agent destination I told before you. anybody was, <laughs> told before you. most people were. Yep. You've talked about the convenience of their practice facility being located <laughs> close to both the, the arena and really quick, quick ride to Manhattan. I'm telling the Knicks they need to build one close to that city. What are you hearing about Brooklyn now that the big guys are in there and, you know, Kyrie's obviously injured. kitty has been injured the whole season. They're 26 and 29. Just sort of, eh, what are you hearing now? No, I, I, obviously it's a disappointing year so far with the whole Kyrie thing. I just think that it takes, from an organizational standpoint, it takes a while to deal with superstars. And we're in a, we're in a superstar era where they control a lot. LeBron, Ka- uh, Kawhi now, uh, Kyrie and Katie have huge power. Uh, before they were someone where, hey, everyone had to go to New York and train. Because of them, they were in LA this summer training, trying to make it more pleasing to them. Katie loves LA and trying to do that. And so of a team that was San Antonio-esque of culture and doing it this way, they're trying to keep that same culture and, but yet transform to, 
to to the basically the key players, the superstars liking, and that's a that's a difficult, tough one to have. Miami says it's either our way or the highway. Other people, Clippers, Lakers, somebody said, hey, you know what? We're going to go to our stars. Every team situation is different, and I think they they had some rocky moments early. I think it's gotten better of late. I think that they all knew this was a, a gap year, and I think you know Kyrie is an interesting person where you're trying to figure him out. You try, you know, he loves basketball. You know, he's talented. You know that he, he leads in a different way and he's got to figure that out because if not, man, it's going to really hurt Brooklyn's chances. Next year is the defining season of Kyrie Irving's career because I, thousand percent. I think the book was long closed on whether he can be the best player on a championship team. That's over. He can't be now the book, the book that is now like three years in is his teams don't get any worse when he doesn't play. Now, they, maybe their ceiling is lower. They yep. don't get appreciably better, whatever, yep. but they're, they're not losing steam without him. And next year, Durant comes back, and Durant, the Durant we remember pre-Achilles is is just maybe the best player in the whole NBA. Like He's yep. the number one guy on that team, and it's not close. But it's it, it, the, the story of Kevin Durant's career is this the sort of unique place he has in history of being the number one guy but not having the ball the most because there's another star point guard yep. and we're right. And that can work. That has worked. Yep. It's fine. But that point guard has to navigate life of, yeah, I'm the point guard. I have the ball a lot, but I'm not the number one guy. And like, that's going to be Kyrie has done that with LeBron. But that would made it so unique with LeBron. LeBron is the most unselfish one. So he's giving you the rock to be able to do it. LeBron's duty was just to get everyone else going. Hey, let me get Kevin Love going. Let me get JR a three. Let me get Shumper. Let me get Tristan Thompson a dunk. And so Kyrie just had to worry about scoring. But now when you get with Kevin, that's why it's so fascinating. No one knows. It's just like when it was like the Russ versus Harden. At least them two, hey, they're good one-on-one players. Go make it happen. Kevin Durant needs the ball. Yes, he can play passing. Kyrie needs the ball. So how are they going to coexist? Their personalities off the court dealing with media. And yet the good thing with them, and that's why they picked them over the Knicks and other teams, is they have talent around cares. Spencer might be the most underrated player in the NBA. He is an all-star caliber player, big, athletic. Joe Harris, one of the best shooters. Jared Allen Young, they have DeAndre Jordan. They've got draft picks to be able to trade. So everything is there, but it's fascinating. Yes, Kyrie's shown big shot taker, top five potential talent easily. That's what we want to see, and that's why I'm so sad, obviously, with the Achilles injury and stuff like that. And you're right. That will be the biggest year of his career, but let's be honest, man. That man has nothing to prove. He's won one, but for him to to get back to where we know Kyrie can, next year is definitely the, the mark. What's one? How? So Brooklyn is famous for its, like, medical team. For sure. And they're all over. They, they're they're measuring everything. Mm-hmm. They got you. They, they know what's good for you, what's bad for you. So two questions. Number one, how do they tread the line of being helpful without being invasive to your privacy? And number two, what did you learn about, what's one thing you learned about yourself and your body from them that you didn't know before? So let's first go about this. Most star players have their own medical people. So Kevin Durant has his own medical yes. people, right? And so uh, I'm not sure about Kyrie. I know KD, but I, 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 would, I would probably say that, you know, someone, Kyrie probably brought, brought someone in also. So when it comes to them, their medical staff is, I mean, it's it's made up of so many people, a couple people from Australia, Toronto, uh, they had Lan- uh, Lance Armstrong, the guy who basically did the schedule for his biking and what he needed to rest, when to, how much to drink. He's one of the head of their operation. So they, it's such a, a technical when it comes to the data and knowing the body. And when you run practice, hey, your number is 500. Um, 900 might be too high. If you're not playing, you need to, you need to get at least 500 in practice. Everything is to the T in the data and it's phenomenal how it is. And so what I learned about my body, they test every Monday your hamstrings, your quads, your, your, your back to your, your strength in your arms. And so each day they can tell by each month when you're getting tired, what are the reasons? Are you losing weight? Are you gaining weight? Where's your muscle mass? How you had? And so I remember for mine, my hamstring muscles were low. I was playing a, a, a little bit, too many more minutes than I was accustomed to. I was starting probably around 27 minutes at this time, and my hamstring numbers were low. And it was something they were so trying to. So how are they measuring the strength? Are you doing some uh, weight exercises? Yeah, it's a weight something? exercise. So basically, it's a machine, and it's out there. I forget the name of it. I wish I had. I, someone told me the name. I don't had. I know, right? And so basically, I'm laying on my back, and I'm basically pressing my my uh, Achilles into this machine so it kind of goes to your hamstring of your of basically the strength and it was low and after basically a week later I popped my hamstring really I missed 17 18 games 
Joe and Harris. So they saw it. We saw it coming. But it's not like, even though you see it coming, we're trying to do everything to minimize injuries. I'm playing high minutes. It's definitely no one's fault is how it was. And the recovery process of, for me to get back, how, how extensive it was from week one, week two. You have to pass this to pass this to get to this one. It took me an extra probably two weeks with them than with on a normal team. And never since then, I've had no hamstring problems. I think it's definitely, think culture, medical cultures like that are, can be hard for coaches. Yep. Cause coach just, the coaches need to win the game in front of them. For sure. And definitely some players have been like, I, I, I kind of just want to play. Man, the medical people might be the second most powerful people in the NBA when it comes to buy, behind GMs and the president. Depend, the depending on the team. The team. Depending they, on they, the they team. Have, hey, they're telling you how practice will go. How, how much, when it comes to that, that medical staff, they're telling you of how, what they have to do by, by what Kevin Durant, Kyrie played the night before. Or, hey, you know, we have to, they got to sleep in. Oh yeah, you, you, you gotta take that drill out. Oh, man, it, 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 if you ever get a coaches, um, behind the scenes, off the record, they'll tell you how it is. And so we live in a different age of back to backs and minutes played and, and we come in there and the certain electrolytes we have to take and be able to stay ready. Man, medical staff have huge power. Joe Harris once told me, I'm Googling it now because yep. he said it, it was part of the interview. Um, <laughs> I love Joe. Uh, he said, he's about um, to get paid also. He's already gotten paid pretty well, but yeah, he's, he's, Joe Harris is a good player. That's yes. why it was disheartening, and I'm choosing to hope that it was an accident that Kyrie left Joe Harris out of the, we need more pieces on this team. He's tripping. Joe Harris is a major piece. Every team needs, every, if you're, if you're a ball dominant player, you want a Joe Harris he, on your team. He's the modern, modernized JJ Redick. He can come off screens, he can finish, and he can shoot the three. He once told me that the Nets medical staff was tracking the color of his piss, and I said, oh, that's a joke, right? He said, oh, no, no, that's, no. that's a real thing they're doing. Yep. Um, which is not that scientific, but no. I just, you know, I, 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 then I wanted to know the mechanics of it. Are you, is there a cup who's transferring the cup? What's the chain of custody <laughs> of the cup? Um, two more quick ones and I'll let you go. Yep. Uh, in a recent Q and A with the athletics, uh, Bill Orem, which yep. was like Jared Dudley t- talks about lots of things. Mm-hmm. He asked you who your least favorite teammate was. Oh man, this one comes up. Well, when I said Blake, I mean, it was, you, I, you say, I was, I was surprised. Why? A couple reasons. Number one, I just, I didn't think it was it was that bad. And number two, I don't I like Blake strikes me as not a bad teammate. Like he works hard, he cares. His personality, I think, can be sometimes a little aloof. Teammates yeah. say, um, but I never. I just it's not an. I thought it was going to be someone who was a, a lazy or didn't care about defense or didn't care about winning or so. And Blake doesn't strike me as any of those. I'm not here to talk bad about Blake Griffin. Not a bad teammate. For one, if if anyone knows me and you could talk of, I played on what, seven teams now or something like that. A lot of teams. I get along with everybody. Now we are talking about these one. We're talking the Ben Simmons one. We're talking about Blake Griffin. 99% of people. And even outside, I work out of impact from the old school to the new school. No, this is why yeah, I'm asking. That's why I'm asking. It I know. It's surprising. surprising. And so the reason, uh, the problem I had with him was that was the weirdest team I've been on. And I've do- documented that. It was bipolar. You know, guys would go out to dinner, not invite you. You see him at dinner. Guys do this. Everyone, it was so click heavy, which is fine. There's and nothing that's wrong the, with that. And that's the Sterling year. It is the Sterling to year. To top it, it off. Year. It was just more so, um, Kind of after I left, the words that were being exchanged while we were playing and some of the stuff he said, I'm not going to say it right now. And so I, I took offense to it. And so because of that, it wasn't really even while we was playing, we had some stuff and that team to, to put the, to put the word that fit that team's bipolar. This team, they act one way, one, one, one day and act the way another day. That's just what it is. And that's why we didn't win and make it. But it's really after that, us going and having the different stuff and different words. And like, you can call it trash talk and call it what it is. And so for me, it's just it's not someone I get along with. I don't, he doesn't get, if you ask him, he doesn't take probably too kindly of me. And, and hey, I still, I still respect him. I think, I mean, before his injury last year, he was playing at he made all NBA last hell year. of a player. Man, hey, expanding his three point range. So when it comes to him as a player, boom, but leadership in that, that's where we, that's where I kind of had it, uh, saw a different light. I forgot that you were on this team and I have to ask you about it because it was one of the strangest and almost instantly forgotten sagas of recent NBA history. Okay. Mm-hmm. So here's the team. <laughs> here's the team. Um, Earl Watson getting fired three games into the sec- his second season as Suns coach. 0-3. Yep. Earl Watson fired. Yep. And I remember writing, I wrote a big piece on the Suns a few weeks after about where they go from here. And I remember talking to everyone involved being like, there's just, there are all these rumors about, well, the players already knew it was gonna, he was gonna get fired and this and that. And I just, I remember talking to people in the know saying, there's just a puzzle piece here that's not, in the puzzle and right. it's frustrating me because I don't really get what happened like Bledsoe's contract extension was involved because possibly involved so 
then Earl Watson finally does an interview about it last year. Yep. Um, and says, they told me before the season that I had, they essentially gave me two weeks notice before the season. Wow. So did players, like, what the hell happened? You're in the I, locker room. I, I did not, I, all I remember is the owner, Robert Sarver, who obviously is a good friend of mine, just basically had expectations of going to the playoffs. But those expectations aren't reality. You had a young team. You just drafted two people in the top top ten. I feel like you could be talking about the last seven Phoenix Suns teams for sure. <laughs> and, and, and so that's why I thought their plan was. I thought their plan was, hey, we're gonna two three years gain. We're gonna lose gain as not lose on purpose, but in the sense of, hey, we're gonna play all the young guys. We're gonna gain all these assets, and eventually let's make a trade. We're gonna hit on one. You hit on Devin Booker. You just hit on DeAndre Ayton. But it took before. You had Josh Jackson. You had Bender. You had Marquise Chris. They've all now gone from your team. Yeah, Tyler the Warriors. Ewers. The Warriors are like this. The the for sure. Phoenix scrap you're right, right you're right and so I what I think what happened was is Earl got the job two or three years too early I think that he had a I think he's a a hell of a mentor when it comes to speaking and knowledge of the game from that I think that they threw him in the fire too early and I think that I want to be a head coach one day or possibly a GM and it's something that you need experience and Jason Kidd would tell you that him getting his first job and like it takes a while you need four or five years so a lot of stuff that he did wrong with of dealing with young players dealing with organization wise and the communication level and I think that he was frustrated knowing that he could potentially be fired so in a way at the end he's going to do it his way and I think some of the word choices he he used about the organization he would kind of take back and I think that if he had to do it all over again he probably would have done it his way and that's the difference when you take a job like that and you're not on the same page as the organization, um, but I do remember. I don't know if they would do it all over again. They had a trade on the. They had a deal on the uh, on the table. Josh Jackson basically for Kyrie Irving. That's been rumored. No, nah, that's that's true. Oh, speaking of, <laughs> I think we deaded that. I think if I'm not mistaken, that's the Suns deading that trade. And I say that now. This was Kyrie pre Boston, and we weren't in the whole. If you want to say winning mode, but you put him on that team, and and that's where this is about. This is about. Getting these young stars to play. This is what, this is what's going to happen. It's very rare you draft a la the Warriors. These stars are coming together whether you like it or not. And so the USA is basically the free agency pool of, of the talking and you better have it. And that's why Phoenix is so perfect because NBA players love, I mean, I got my homes in Phoenix. It's a sleeping giant. They ain't sleeping. They know about it. Hey, look at, if they don't let them start getting good. They're good. They'll get free agents because people want to play with Booker. I'll tell you that. Uh, by the way, so you you spoke with certainty before about the midseason tournament. You're uh, you're on the players' union, right? I am not on the players' oh, I, union. I thought you I, were. I am a co-captain of the now. And now I'm you know, Michelle Roberts. I'm I'm heavily involved of speaking out and how it is. And we need to get this thing. Uh, the NBA. When I, when I talk about the thing is basically. The revenue getting up. We need the best. We need we need more stars playing against these guys. You obviously, here load management. Paul George misses this game. This By the way, somebody with Brooklyn told me. Yeah. Ask Jared about load management. <laughs> I don't know why they told me that. Right. I didn't follow up. Do you have strong load load management opinions? Yeah, I mean, I mean, from one, it's a business, and so I understand you have to, but we can't load management when stars, when superstars are playing superstars. This is how it. This is how it should be. This is how our, we we owe it to it. We we're trying to build the revenue for more salaries for the league, and and, and let's bet we have eighty two games. People want to see LeBron versus Kawhi. They want to see Ben Simmons versus Giannis, Celtics versus Bob. I mean, like, man, that's what it's about. And so when these guys are taking off, I understand the goal is a championship. Yes, it is. But, hey, low man's against another team. Okay, last one. Uh, we were talking before we started here. I, I didn't realize you, you played New Orleans. I know you're playing them tomorrow. You mm-hmm. play them again next week or, or this coming Sunday, actually. Um, yep, back twice this week. Uh, you will have some say – in, and you play Memphis in between. Yep, already played Memphis already once too. And you have, week. you, that's right. So you have some say in who your first round opponent is. Do you care? And, uh, well, uh, we're, we're going to get your first impressions of Zion pretty damn soon. I'm excited to see Zion. I, I think that, I mean, he's had the most hype since LeBron. I think, I think that he, every time he plays ratings, man, the NBA put him opening night and Christmas. So it tells you what the NBA thinks about him. Man, he played seven, eight games, put him in the rookie game. We need Zion for as a league, and so I'm all I'm bigger than just obviously. When I look at stuff, I look at the grand scheme of the NBA. But when it comes to the eight seed, uh, Zion and Brandon Ingram, Drew Holiday. You know the, what? You know what the league is rooting for? Probably that, Zion, yeah, for that. sure, for sure. It's gonna star power. Anthony then, Davis but, versus Anthony Davis's old team. I agree. 
But how about this though? I mean, is anyone playing better than Damian Lillard right now? Like, I know he just got hurt. Yeah, he's hurt. Now. So we, the, the NBA wants Damian Lillard in the playoffs, and then John Morant. I know Zion gets to love John. Mar- John Morant's a bad young boy. Oh, boy. Listen here in Memphis, and I know they traded away their vets. Uh, when it comes to Jaron Jackson, can play. They just have a good culture set. You can just tell that they're well coached over there. So it's not really a. It's not really one that you. Um, are looking for because obviously if you play your game you think you can beat any of those teams I would say you always want to play the youngest team I mean people with the least experience so I don't know what team that would be because obviously I remember when I was a young kid and the mistakes I made my first two but well, I can tell you who it would who, be who, who, Memphis who, 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 Memphis is the youngest team yeah I mean hey we play them again at, at Memphis um, but you know, I mean listen when it comes to that playoffs, and, and they'll see if it's Memphis, if it's Portland, or or, or if it's New Orleans, man. Uh, we're going to have our hands full, but listen, one step at a time, we know what the goal is, and ho- hopefully we can get there. I mean, hope we can speed this up and get there right away. Well, you got a shot, and that's all <laughs> you can sure. ask for. This is a team, I when I was when I was when had Danny Green on my podcast a couple of months ago, uh-huh. whatever that was, we talked about how you know Danny's been on championship teams. And like, he knows. You know when you have a really good team who maybe can figure it out, and but and then you know when you're on a team that's like, all right, we got we got a shot. Right. This is a team that has a shot. No doubt about it. Two of the top five best players, four or five guys have been all defensive teams, all stars. And when I look at this team, there's no ego, especially on the bench. Everyone knows their role, what they have to do, but we have to get better. We 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 have to start putting some stuff again defensively, uh, offensively. Be able to have creativity, moving the ball side to side, and not just getting stuck at one thing. And then a belief. Um, we all believe it, and now it's got to go out there and do it. So we'll see April thirteenth when we get started. That's it. All right, Jared Dudley. Thank you for your thoughts. Uh, thanks for coming on, and uh, I will see you tomorrow for uh, Zion, baby. Hey, we'll do another one in August. There you go. <laughs> Appreciate it.